Who, uh, Dr. Henderson? Thank you, Dr. Rubin. All right, it does a couple points of clarification. The nice thing about going last and being the co-chair is that I'll be able to cover a couple of hot topics and breeze through some stuff that's already been covered. Just a point of clarification, actually, Dr. Other guy, Dr. Scott, who is the president of the Brain Engineering Council, sees me in that, uh, in that distinction. Um, Let's see, just as disclosures, uh, I'm a consultant to a number of uh, neuroimaging uh, companies, uh, uh, particularly scans. <coughs> now, let's talk about brain imaging for a minute. <coughs> I don't know if you have to made the point that a test has to have reasonably good significance. And she said, you know, 75% sensitivity, 75% specificity. That's pretty good. And what I'll show you today is that, in fact, back to the number of has much higher significance, much higher sensitivity, much higher specificity. Um, the cost to healthcare, this has been well addressed by Dr. Amy, but I want to re underscore that by missing the diagnosis, by assuming that we're talking about ADHD because we're looking at a child who's running about the supermarket and missing other diagnoses, I think that is a tremendous cost to the healthcare system. <coughs> now, Many tests in medicine are assumed to be 100% accurate. We make medical decisions based on those tests every single day, lithium levels, for example. But all diagnostic tests are imperfect. All tests can underestimate or overestimate the presence of the disease. Just look at imaging, for example. Let's go back to radiology. Radiology trained, I'm not board certified in radiology. Uh, low bar and segmental class, <coughs> what could it be? Well, we obviously think a tumor. Uh, it could also be carcinoma, a foreign body, a mucus plug, an AR aneurysm, it could just be asthma. Okay, the difference, you don't do surgery on asthma. Flaring of the same thing. Could be chronic hemolytic anemia, fracture, various lipid storage disease, or even a normal variant. I don't need a brain scan. A good psychiatric evaluation will tell me the patient's diagnosis. You are absolutely correct, as long as you're talking about the DSM. The DSM is, is a handful of symptoms and signs arranged in, in categories. How many of your patients have more than one diagnosis? If you look at depression, how many of those patients are also anxious? If you have ADHD, how many of those patients also have rage outbursts? I hope there's someone here today from the Child Psycho Farm list because we've been debating this issue of, well, what do you do with a rageful child who has a diagnosis of ADHD? It must be, well, they just need more Ritalin. I suggest the possibility, well, maybe there's something wrong with the temporal lobe, and Dr. Amon has done a fantastic job of showing how that might play itself out. We'll see how the list responds. I hope that the, someone here has seen this. <laughs> but again, you can do a clinical examination, and you know, the, I'm just saying, I can see now that your subgeneral anterior cingulate virus is very overactive. <laughs> In other words, you can see that the patient is depressed, but can you tell me that they're treatment resistant? Can you tell me that they're going to fail the next six medications, which if you do a responsible clinical trial is six weeks per medication, and several months later the patient is still depressed, if not possibly dead. The subgeneral anterior cingulate virus, uh, the uh, subgeneral anterior cingulate virus area that was originally identified by Wayne Grevitz and, and Helen Mayberg has capitalized on it. Now, Helen Mayberg has a patent on deep brain stimulus, and she speaks about it regularly, and she has research studies running on it right now. And do you think that she does a, a, a surgery and implants electrodes on a patient based on a clinical examination alone? No. She does a functional brain scan. She looks for that overactive anterior cingulate virus. <laughs> and she has said that the converging clinical biochemical neuroimaging and post-mortem evidence suggests that depression is unlikely to be a single diagnosis. Rather, it is a systems level disorder. There are different things going on. Being diagnosed with depression by DSM uh, standards does not mean that you have an automatic answer as to what the treatment might be. And Dr. Amon has done a very good job of already covering <coughs> our psychopharmacological failures. So, psychiatry has a problem. It's a diagnostic paradox that we've created. 
we base our diagnoses on reported symptoms, three different signs, we group them into clusters, we give them a category, then we debate the category, and with the DSM-5, we throw out entire categories or regroup them. But at the end of the day, most of these symptoms are found overlapping or different diagnoses. Let's take that kid in the supermarket or the kid in the school who can't sit still and he's in, he's hyperactive, he's out of the seat, he's fiddling with the, he's dropping things, he's losing things. He's ADHD, it's obvious. Give him a stimulant. Or maybe not. Maybe he has toxicity. Maybe he has cadmium toxicity. Maybe he has a tumor lobe, uh, uh, tumor uh, in his temporal lobe. Maybe he has um, sort of this overactive brain, uh, what Dr. Amon has coined is the ring of fire, which is probably in some mood disorder variant. Maybe he truly has bipolar disorder. Maybe he has toxicity. Maybe he has a traumatic brain injury. These are all things that I have seen in my clinical evaluation of patients. There is a positive objective laboratory data for any of these diagnoses. We're guessing, I think someone has said. So is there a neuroimaging fingerprint for each diagnosis? Probably not, because each diagnosis from DSM is not a single neurobiological process. All right, so I'm going to explain a little bit about functional brain imaging, then seeing how fast I get through all of this, I'll teach you a little bit about the physics of neural imaging. This is uh, from a work of Tom Woolsey, famous for his work on the rat barrel cortex. I had the pleasure of working under Dr. Woolsey in my PhD work. The, uh, the barrel cortex is sort of the map of the rat's whiskers, and each little column, cortical column, represents one whisker. So this, this could be anything, this could be a visual cortex if you like. The lamellar cortical afferents come in and terminate here when they, um, uh, are, uh, an active potential comes in and stimulates. There is increased activity of the cortical neuron in that column which causes the neuroglia to reach, release particular chemicals that causes increased blood flow into that particular column of tissue which results in increased venous flow out. This is the basis of all functional neuroimaging. Uh, in terms of uh, excluding, of course, uh, um, well, I won't go into uh, receptors and such. If you look at fMRI, they're looking at venous runoff. If you look at SPECT, it's looking at arterial inflow. If you look at FTG PET, it's looking at the increase in glucose uptake of these cortical neurons. Now, one thing about imaging is you always got to look at the color scale. Let's just Quickly, grayscale is what radiologists like to read in. Grayscale is great for seeing like fine little detail differences, but it's really lousy for looking at pixel density differences. So let's look over here on the opposite side of the scale that I like to use. If we look at sort of the mean blood flow right here based on a number of studies, including studies by Mike Debu and Ishmael Main and my mentor, about the mean blood flow in the brain is about 72%. One standard deviation up is about 84, one standard deviation down about 60. Right, I challenge you to tell me that you can see the difference between one standard deviation here in the grayscale. Or if we look at what nuclear medicine like to use here in the heated object. Now hot cold, we can start to see that, but if you go the other direction, can you see one standard deviation here? Oh, here you can. Here you can. Here it's very clear. Okay. This patient was scanned at a local hospital in Denver and said, and they have one paragraph report perfectly normal scan, all, all, you know, all this stuff about uh, the protocol, and then normal cerebral perfusion. The patient continued to have great difficulties, personality difficulties, memory difficulties. They came and got a scan on a camera that's specially designed for looking at brains using protocols that are specific for brains, and here's her scan. And this is using this color scale here. So what you see is the uh, anterior single gyrus there is a little more overactive. The visual cortex is overactive. There's some decreased blood flow that comes back to the brain. But let's look at this uh, image here. This is comparing that patient's brain statistically to a normative database. This is a normal database developed by Ishmael Mann. These patients didn't use drugs. They had no traumatic brain injury, they had no family history of psychiatric disorders, they had no diagnoses of psychiatric disorders. A very clean population. It took Dr. Manny years to develop this. If you compare that patient's brain, and here's the color scale, uh, green is one standard deviation below the mean um, 
Sorry, my right hand is still not. By the way, I had sort of lanthier spinal fusion, hence the collar, and my right hand is not cooperating quite yet. Um, one, this is two standard deviations below the mean. Light blue is three standard deviations, dark blue is four standard deviations below the mean. And you can see there's hypoperfusion throughout the frontal lobe, largely sparing the parietal lobe. And if I show you your posterior cingulate daughter, it's one of the landmarks in dementia, it'd be perfectly clean. So this patient here, getting a community scan, was diagnosed to be completely normal. Here was diagnosed with early frontal temporal dementia. Now let's make a point at the American Academy of Neurology. A poster was presented by uh, uh, someone from the University of Colorado saying, FTG spec, FTG PET and scans and any of this stuff is useless compared to a clinical evaluation of Alzheimer's. And they based it on the fact that the community studies that they were getting back, looking like this, read like this, and these stamped images, no statistical analysis, were inconclusive and missing uh, early diagnoses many times or over-diagnosing in other cases. So let's talk about um, that in, in uh, a little bit more detail. I want to address radiation safety. Somebody brought that up. Uh, uh, that, oh, you know, well, we're exposing patients to radiation. Let's put this in perspective. The Bayer Committee is charged with sort of assessing cancer risk. It's followed uh, the Hiroshima patients for 65 years now, and, and these patients who are exposed to uh, long-lasting um, uh, things like strontium and such uh, that stay in your body for a long time are continuous uh, uh, radiation emitters. But when you look at what the Health Physics Society said just again in 2010, the health risks have, are either too small to be observed or non-existent for exposure below 10 rems. Uh, NIH says the same thing. The biological effect of low-level radiation at cellular levels seems extremely <coughs> low for medical procedures. Like Debu himself, who last year took the con position saying, oh, you know, spec scans. In fact, in his uh, letter to the editor said, we're exposing patients to dangerous levels of radiation. Mike Debu has published numerous book chapters. The most recent was in the book uh, that uh, Dr. Maven mentioned by Tulowski. Uh, in 2010, was to say to clarify the fact that spec and PET procedures have no more risk than MRI-based procedures. Indeed, there are no data that have ever demonstrated any harm to humans by radiation exposures at diagnostic imaging levels. In fact, current data supports the presence of radiation hormesis. Let's explain that a little bit. But let's talk about what is our radiation. We act like we don't get any radiation at all. Just we are all concerned when they started using uh, uh, um, x-ray in the airports. But let's look at background radiation. On the coast, your background radiation is 2.93 uh, millisieverts. If you have uh, the misfortune of living in the mountainous state of Colorado where they used to mine uranium, guys, it's uh, 3.87. Um, if you fly in a jet airplane, you're exposed to gamma radiation. If you get a head CT, you get 9.13 millisieverts. If you get a fluoroscopy uh, done, it's about 14.03. This is with child uh, protocols. There's the whole movement on image genetic that reduces the CT exposure of ionizing X radiation. So let's put that in perspective. So here's a PET scan, an adult 7.03 millisieverts. An amyloid, amyloid marker scan is estimated to be 7.03 millisieverts based on the FDA clinical trials. A spec scan in an adult is 6.80 millisieverts, and in a child it ranges from 2 to 4 millisieverts. A thallium scan is 17 millisieverts. If you get a, if you go to the cardiac cath lab and they put and they do a cardiac cath procedure on you, you know your number one side effect is second and third degree burns to the chest wall from the amount of fluoroscopy time. The number of millisieverts can be in the hundreds for that type of procedure. So let's just look at radiation, background radiation, even if you look on the coast, 2.93 compared to getting a spec scan, 6.8. We're talking three times your annual background radiation. Now, radiation bad though, right? Well, here's some studies that uh, sort of argue differently. 14,000 infants treated with radiation from a man genome. The average dose was 13 rems, so that's a big dose. 
At 39 year follow up in the Swedish registry, the relative risk for cancer at, uh, at low doses of one microgram was one. At the kind of physiological dose that we're talking for a spec scan was 0 0.9. Now, with, I don't know if it's with 14,000 patients, but that's just a, it, with that big of an end, your power is probably significant, but it's actually maybe protective. This is a bad idea of hormesis that maybe radiation actually is good for you. Think about it a second. We evolved on a world with a whole lot more radioactivity than there is now. Think about it. All the radioactive material that naturally occurs in the world has been slowly decaying over time, thousands, millions of years. We evolved in an environment with a naturally higher background radiation. Set aside all the man-made sources of radiation, computers, smoke detectors, etc. We evolved in a higher radiation background. Now, at high doses, yeah, there's a little, there's definite increased risk for leukemia associated with radiation in 17,000, excuse me, 14,000 infants. 11,000 patients treated with radiation for tinea capillaries, okay? All under the age of 17, age 7.3, average dose 9.3 grams, that's more than a, a uh, spec scan, compared to 16,000 controls, a 22-year follow-up, the relative risk of uh, increased uh, leukemia was zero. The relative risk of increased thyroid cancer was vanishingly small. Ernst and Fried have summarized this very well. There's an additional article that just came out that also summarizes this issue in particular with children. Ernst and Fried looked at, uh, were looking particularly at children. They reviewed these series of hormesis and the supporting evidence. They concluded the health risk for low level radiation not be detected above the noise of adverse events just in one of the cells. All right, so let's turn to neuropsychiatric disorders a little bit. The neurological burden in the U.S. is increasing. The autism spectrum disorder, I don't think anybody in this room is not aware that the rate of autism is increasing uh, year. Why? I'm clear. Uh, but it's now 88 out of 100. So 88 out of 1,000. It was 103 out of 1,000, now 88 out of 1,000, which keeps going up. Traumatic brain injury. Um, it's estimated, this is a very conservative estimate, that there's 300,000 annual incidents of traumatic brain injury, but we've got one, the uh, CDC estimates that 1.5 million people get a traumatic brain injury every year. Uh, I can't the name. Sure. Um, a number of studies have looked at uh, the sequelae of mild traumatic brain injury. Depression and anxiety occur at very high levels following traumatic brain injury. Um, Alzheimer's disease, this is uh, where we're going to focus for a little bit uh, in just a few moments. So let's talk about traumatic brain injury. We say there are no studies showing that, that uh, SPECT is helpful in traumatic brain injury. Well, there are several. Now, some of these are older studies, probably the best in Jacob, which we'll talk about here. But let's look at the sensitivity and specificity. 91% sensitivity, 92% sensitivity. 54% sensitivity out of the gate, the initial scan within a week of injury in predicting uh, their recovery over time. And if you follow them at 12 months, then you, a negative, a positive spec scan with 100% predictive of having neurologic psychoactive. So uh, the yokes looked at this, 89% sensitivity, 80% specificity. So we were talking earlier numbers, 75%, that was a reasonable test. So let's look a little closer at Jacobs. He evaluated uh, 136 patients, not 12, not 17, 136 patients. They had CTs and MRIs at the time of their injury, all over motor vehicle accidents. They had a spec within one week. If they had an abnormal initial spec, they entered with repeat specs. If they did not, they did not have a repeat uh, spec. But they were reevaluated neuropsychiatrically at three months, six months, and 12 months. And let's look at the results. So 136 patients. And we're just going to focus on positive predictive value. If you had an initial abnormal spec, you had a 44% chance that a year down the road, you would still have symptoms. If your repeat scan at one year was abnormal, there was a 100% chance that you had symptoms. Okay, we're not scanning patients a week after they get a um, motor vehicle accident. We're seeing them a couple of years later when their lives are falling apart. And Jacob's study, that was 100% predictive. 
If you have a normal scan at the gate, it's 92% predictive that you will not have any symptoms a year later. And you can see the uh, negative picture value increases. Jacobs appropriately concluded that the spec can play an important role in decisions involving mild traumatic brain injury patients' ability to return to work, to function, and to return to normal life. These uh, uh, studies uh, were part of what uh, the European Association of Nuclear Medicine used to include, uh, conclude that SPEC has shown perfusion abnormalities in traumatic brain injury despite normal morphology and perhaps have prognostic value. The American College Radiology stands by the position clinical indications for SPEC include but are not limited to evaluation of system, uh, symptomatic brain injury especially in the absence of CT and or MRI findings. So let's look at a case. This uh, woman was in a motor vehicle accident. A year later, she's still having significant symptoms, covering a wide range of psychiatric and mild neurological symptoms. Here's her CT scan. Red is completely normal. Here's her MRI. I won't go through the whole thing, but red is completely normal. But look here at the convexity here in the brain. And here's her spec scan. We're looking here again at the convexity of the brain in the statistical map compared to normal population. And that area that is red is completely normal, the MRI is not. And the areas that were also red in this, the MRI was red, is completely normal. I won't show you the entire MRI, but here looking at the temporal lobe, you can see marked areas of statistically significant abnormally low perfusion. And then looking at the raw data, here's a coronal scan, here's the color scale. Blue is not good, blue is bad. Green is not very good, yellow is normal. You can see the decreased function of the temporal lobe as well as the convexity of the brain. Dementia. The patient comes to you, they can't draw a clock. Guess what? <coughs> it's too late. And at this point, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. Unless, of course, you give them an antipsychotic, in which case you can kill them if they have Lewy body dementia. Dementias are increasing dramatically. You know, we're aging. 1% of the persons over the age of 60 have dementia, 2% over 65 will have uh, dementia, and it increases at doubles every five years. The American population is estimated. So it's estimated the number of people with dementia will quadruple in America by 2025. In addition, 30% of the patients over the age of 70 will have mild cognitive impairment. So start thinking about that number. Put that on a global scale, 136 million patients will have mild cognitive impairment by the year 2025. 136 million. Normal brain, Alzheimer's brain. You can see the decrease. Now, if you're looking for this on an MRI, you know what that gets read as? This is normal atrophy for age. By the time the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's made, there has been significant pathology in neural blocks. The neuroprotective therapies that we have available today can make a difference in slowing that progression and the things that are in the pipeline that are very exciting uh, are going to be important to, uh, to administer early in the course of the disease before the pathology load is too large to overcome. So early identification of the disease is becoming crucial. Now just recently, uh, this. That point was argued in, uh, by the, editor, the former editor of the Psychiatric Times, who said, don't tell our patients that they have mild cognitive impairment. What hope can we offer them? It's sort of bringing the death down. He took a slightly different position on rebuttal, but my response was, we need to tell them. We need to tell them so they can make changes in their lives, and they, because there are things that they can do to mitigate uh, Alzheimer's. Molecular imaging such as PET and SPECT and no amyloid uh, techniques are going to advance our ability to do that. Let's take a look at this for a second. So according to the American College of, Radio uh, of uh, uh, Neurology, mild cognitive impairment is diagnosed way out here in this uh, light beige bar by memory problems. Your mini metal status exam has to be below 25. Uh, and here on your cognitive impairment with dementia and the grayscale, you're, you can't draw a clock. But all the pathology starts here, years before. Amyloid accumulation begins years before. Tau mediated neuronal injury and dysfunction begins years before. In fact, it's estimated by the time a patient is diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, 
they've lost 60% of the neurons in their entorhinal cortex. The entorhinal cortex has a direct line of communication to the posterior cingulate gyrus. This will become important in a few moments. Looking at the hippocampus, hippocampal volume changes. Yeah, they have about a 74% uh, predictive value for Alzheimer's disease. But then again, as has been pointed out, the hippocampus is abnormal in schizophrenia. It's abnormal in depression. It's abnormal in alcoholism. And it's abnormal in PTSD, just to name a few. So it's not a particularly robust marker. There are things that patients can do to prevent the progression of Alzheimer's. Genetic mutations, obviously, you know, if you were able to eat four, uh, then you've got some challenges and your risk is much higher. If you have Down syndrome, your chance of dying of Alzheimer's disease uh, is very high by the time you're 30. But these types of uh, misfolding and aggregations of A-beta, they can be prevented and reduced by doing things like reducing your A-beta load, lowering your cholesterol, increasing your omega-3 fatty acids. There's evidence that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, although it's weak evidence, helps. Now, so the cardiologist has been saying take a baby aspirin every day for years. There's another good reason to do it. These are things that can modify the progression of the disease. By the time you're symptomatic and cell death has occurred, your brain is full of plaques, there's not a lot you can do. And there's some really interesting things going on in here, guys. There's some evidence uh, coming out of uh, England that actually, if you look in the plaque of uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease, you'll find the DNA for the herpes 1 virus. This is kind of interesting stuff. That raises a whole other possibility of treatment, of preventative treatment. Another interesting piece is that years before the patient becomes symptomatic, there's loss of neurons in the, in the locus ceruleus, noradrenergic neurons. And so doing things to preserve noradrenergic function could preserve patient function. Neuroimaging biomarkers allow early identification and treatment of dementia. I'm going to make that point. If we look, if we look at the amyloid scans, which are picking up amyloid accumulation way out here before symptom, uh, uh, symptoms occur, these will change our ability to treat the patient. These will change our ability to do studies because we'll have a marker that is much more robust and will uh, allow us to do more rapid studies with smaller samples and uh, more quickly move medications down the pipeline rather than waiting around to see when the patient can't draw a clock in. Neuroimaging, as I'll show, can uh, pick up uh, um, abnormalities in brain function when, when the functional injury is just beginning. For example, there's a spec scan uh, showing Alzheimer's disease, and this is uh, somewhat of a robust case. I just uh, wanted to have a sense of what we're looking at. So, in this statistical comparison to the normal age match, normal database, we see decreased perfusion of frontal cortex, we see decreased perfusion in the uh, posterior cingulate virus and uh, precuneus, we see decreased perfusion in the uh, temporal lobe, and here's the same thing in the raw data, posterior cingulate uh, uh, parietal cortex. Same thing has been shown very well by the uh, with FTG PET imaging. Now, the difference between FTG PET imaging is you FTG PET, you're looking at the accumulation of glucose in a brain cell. So it's, it's a direct marker of brain function. Great! The problem is, it integrates that over 20 minutes. Somebody was asking about ADHD earlier. So you want to do a concentration study on a patient with ADHD, and the marker accumulates over 20 minutes. What do you think your chance of is of actually getting a concentration study on that patient with PET? Very small. But in mild cognitive impairment, you can clearly see, now on this color scale, blue is slightly uh, decreased function, green is a worsening increased function, yellow is even worse, and red is even worse. So here, Alzheimer's disease, parietal low, parietal low, and here's your posterior cingulate gyrus, mild cognitive impairment, you see decrease in posterior cingulate gyrus, and the parietal low, and what's been, been referred to as the bat <coughs> pattern. Uh, nobody think of Rorschach, right? Now, amyloid uh, imaging has been progressing a lot. The original was uh, the PIV protein. And I want to just mention this, uh, one of the, and this will become important in a moment. So PIV in a normal elderly patient shows up in just the white matter. You guys need to know this, even if you're psychiatrists, if you're seeing these patients, and hopefully these scans will be done on your patients that you're concerned about. But some elderly patients are PIV positive. And about 15 
20% of elderly patients are estimated to progress on to Alzheimer's disease, which looks like this, where red is a whole lot of accumulated damage. Now, C11 kids a problem, right? You have to have a cyclotron right next door. C11 is a very short-lived uh, radionucleotide. So uh, <laughs> people have been working on developing an F18. There's actually four. There's only three that are really uh, close in the pipeline to FDA approval. F18 for beta pen, F18 for beta per, and F18 for beta all. Um, this is a slide for Chris Grove. Um, and they are have been in various stages of phase two and phase three trials. And Amavid is the, the first one to have reached the goal of getting FDA approval. Amavid is FDA for beta per. It was developed uh, and, uh, by the, the folks who originally developed uh, C11 PIV and is now, now owned by Eli Lilly. Uh, it was just released uh, on uh, April 11th. Uh, the training to use this is FDA mandated. Uh, it's about 10 milli period dose. The effective dose uh, for you with radiation is about 7.3 uh, millisieverts. Chromium imaging appears at prognostic value and mild target, and mild target impairment. Now, this is important, guys. I said, by the time you can't draw a clock, it's too late. So you need to catch the patients when they have mild target impairment. But what do you do? What kind of mild target impairment? Is mild target impairment leading to frontal temporal dementia? Is it leading to Lewy body dementia? Is it leading to Alzheimer's disease? The perfusion spec can show us early signs. This is a patient who was uh, diagnosed by the uh, referring psychiatrist with uh, Alzheimer's disease with the parietal cortex and the posterior cingulate gyrus are pristine. This is early uh, frontal temporal dementia. With amyloid imaging, uh, amyloid in the normal patient will take up, will be taken up in the white matter, but in patients with mild cognitive impairment, you'll see this cortical imaging. So if you just look here at white matter, you can see that red cortex layer up, out beyond the white matter. And here, if the, the amyloid uh, marker goes all the way out to the edge, and uh, blue is no marker, or red is no marker, blue is a little bit, yellow and up to red is more and more and more. Always look at your numbers. There's one drawback to the amyloid scans, the false positive rate. Uh, in 50-year-olds, it's 10%. In 60-year-olds, it's 12%. In 70-year-olds, it's 30%. And in 8-year-olds, 50% of them will be amyloid positive, and it doesn't necessarily correlate with clinical uh, uh, prognosis. Neuroimaging biomarkers can differentiate forms of dementia. This is important for treatment. Now, this is a very nice study, uh, review article by Nick Bonin, Stokes uh, and and others, colleagues of mine at the Society of Medicine was just published. Now, what I want you to focus on, this is uh, PET imaging of Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy body, frontal temporal dementia with a frontally dominant component, and what's called semantic dementia, we're also in here in the U.S., which is temporal uh, uh, predominant uh, frontal temporal dementia. And the landscape is clearly different. You can clearly differentiate these. And the same thing is true with, uh, uh, with spec brain imaging. Here is an Alzheimer's patient uh, where you can see the decrease in the parietal cortex and posterior cingulate gyrus. And here is a uh, significant front temporal dementia case with frontal and temporal lobe decreased. The hippocampus, excuse me, the parietal lobe is preserved, the posterior cingulate is preserved. Here's the raw data showing the same thing, and I'm going to kind of gloss over that for right now to keep things moving. Same thing is true with the amyloid scans. Healthy control, uh, Alzheimer's disease patient, a frontal temporal dementia patient, perfectly distinguishable. And the, and the sensitivity and specificity of that is quite high. And let me show you. Clinical evaluation and neuropsychological testing followed to autopsy has a 76 to 85 percent sensitivity and 55 to 70 percent specificity for differentiating Alzheimer's disease from the normal control. So it's a 69 positive, uh, percent positive predictive value. Unlike the claim of uh, the uh, recent uh, study presented at the University of Colorado, um, done properly, drug imaging can make a big difference. Now, early studies, and this was actually uh, was uh, summarized in a study by a review article by Duco, who did a meta analysis, but it's also been summarized by Silverman, who, uh, by the way, said that SPEC and PET are quite comparable. SPEC 
with a single headed camera, uh, which I don't advise. And the sensitivity is 740 to 96%, 81 to 84% specificity, and 90% predictive value of differentiating Alzheimer's from normal control. Speco, the multi headed camera has an 82 to 90% sensitivity, uh, 84 to 90% specificity. Now look at FTG, 86 to 90% sensitivity, and 79 to 90% specificity in, in several studies. Now, Scotia colleagues have one uh, where they're showing a 90% sensitive and 90% specificity for differentiating Alzheimer's disease with normal controls. A neuroimaging can help differentiate Alzheimer's disease from neuroimaging from normal controls much better than clinical evaluation and much earlier. The amyloid markers, you can see the sensitivity and specificity. This is, this is shifting as more data emerges, but we're also stuck with this decline in specificity with age. Now, mild cognitive impairment, this is where the money is. These are the guys we want to treat. In fact, with multi-headed cameras, followed longitudinally. 95 to 90% sensitive, 80 to 9 to 20% specific. The perfusion landscape is consistent with amnestic or non-amnestic mild cognitive impairment. In other words, that which will go on to be Alzheimer's and that which will go on to be frontal temporal dementia. Uh, FTG PET, 86% uh, sensitive and 90% uh, sensitive. And these aren't one or two studies. These are several studies and uh, review articles. Amyloid markers, if you have amnestic MCI, it's, it's going to be 83% positive for amyloid. That's predictive of progression of Alzheimer's. Differentiating Alzheimer's from a frontal temporal dementia. And you can see, clinically, it's terrible. It's all over the map. Uh, the perfusion landscape with neuroimaging is much better. Amyloid markers to date, uh, I can't think of an exception, are 100% negative in front of temporal dementia. Now, the problem is, if you're looking at an 80-year-old, you've got about a 30% chance that they're going to be amyloid positive and you're not going to be able to tell. So, perfusion spec is safe and effective modality for distinguishing diagnostic patterns of perfusion in dementias and mild cognitive impairment. FGG PET is similarly the amyloid markers can be used as diagnostic product markers for early diagnosis and evaluation. There's now one FDA approved and two in the hopper. Well, let's talk very quickly about neuropsychiatric diagnoses. And I just want to uh, mention one thing. I have a patient uh, that I treated uh, following their scan. They got a scan because uh, she felt she had had a stroke. And uh, she felt she had a stroke because she had a cardiac procedure, and after that, all of her symptoms began. That makes sense. So you do a, a scan, a spec scan of someone with a stroke, and you expect to see a vascular territory take down. It's a big block gun, and it fits a vascular territory. This patient did not have this. This patient had sort of patchy hypoperfusion all over the place, what Dr. Amon has shown us to be a toxic brain, or possibly an infected brain. This patient turned out to have viral encephalitis, and following treatment with antivirals, had complete 100% recovery. Neurological symptoms went away, her fatigue went away, she went, had been unemployed for a year and a half, she went back to work, she admits she'd been feeding her eight-year-old breakfast cereal every day, three times a day, for months, went back to taking care of her child. So, using a brain scan can help differentiating what looks like an obvious thing. She came to us to see what's the extent of her stroke. It wasn't a stroke at all. But let's talk about specific diagnosis, OCD. One of the things that, uh, that kids who are inattentive and can't sit still, often you know, the differential has to include OCD. They can't sit still because they're uh, perseverating on something or they're obsessing on something. They can't sit still because they have to do their rituals. And this is a classic appearance of OCD. Increased uh, anterior cingulate perfusion, increased uh, bilateral cardiac perfusion, often increased thalamic perfusion. And why is that? Well, briefly, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex serves as the frontal cortex, uh, talks to the striatum, which talks to the globus pallidus, which talks to the thalamus, and reflexes it back. And it's already been pointed out, it saves me a lot of time, is that the striatum is organized. It's not just a gamish, it's organized. There's an emotional part, there's a motor part, there's a part that mitigates or mediates frontal function. And within that part that mediates frontal function, there's
there's one part that's responsible for the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and a different one that's responsible for the anterior cingulate. And within the striatum, there's a further division. There's what's called striosomes and matrosomes. So within the striatum, it's organized in sort of columns within it. And those blobs or columns, the stria, do different things than all the stuff around it, which are called matrix. And again, just to sort of make that point, in um, OCD, we have a frontal cortical, prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate reflex arc down to the, to the striatum, to the uh, uh, globus pallidus, to the thalamus, to the cortex. Now, uh, using SPEC, Lucy et al. looked at 15 patients with OCD versus controlled and showed there was increased blood flow, in other words, activation in the bilateral anterior singlet and the left cutting. Diller looked at 18 children uh, with SPEC and found that there was increased activity in the bilateral cutting, the anterior singlet, and the prefrontal cortex. Lacerda, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, 16 patients versus 17 healthy controls doing a baseline spec. Increased blood flow in the bilateral anterior singlet, right frontal cortex, right cutting, and in the balance. And the severity <coughs> of symptoms correlated with the perfusion of the bilateral inferior frontal cortex and the right cutting. So in other words, we can start to see that not only are these very consistent findings, just looking at spec, but you begin to see that the symptom severity might be correlated with uh, the abnormalities on the scan. Dilla looked at 18 children, increased perfusion, well, again, the cognitive singular through frontal cortex. Saxena, using FDG PET, 45 patients showed increased metabolism, i.e., activation in the cognitive and balance. Now, here's a very interesting finding. Reporting behavior correlated with lower activation of the dorsal anterior cingulate gyrus. This will be important in a moment. 27 patients with OCD using FDG PET pre and post treatment with paroxetine uh, SSRI, which frankly I rarely use. Uh, OCD patients showed increased metabolism in response to paroxetine treatment in the right cot. Excuse me, strike that. Uh, OCD patients showed uh, increased metabolism in the right cardiac baseline with treatment. Uh, there was a reduced cardiac metabolism. So you can see the treatment response. The patient's getting better. Cardiac metabolism, i.e. activation or perfusion, decreases. Major depressive patients could be differentiated from patients with OCD. Now, Freelander did a review of the literature on OCD, highlighting again the anterior cingulate and the cardiac. Quan, uh, reviews the literature, highlighted again, the anterior singlet, the cutting, the overfront cortex, and the thalamus. Big Master reviews the literature, increased activity in the frontal cortex, the anterior singlet, the cutting, and the thalamus. Are you beginning to see a pattern, guys? Now, Larry looked at six refractory OCD patients and, uh, who were being prepared uh, for um, uh, uh, electrostimulation placement in the anterior capsule. Uh, OCD showed elevated activity in the anterior cingulate and some genial cingulate. This is interesting. Helen Neighbor, uh, treatment resistant depression. Posterior orbital frontal cortex, right dorsal lateral frontal cortex, and right anterior insula. With electrode replacement uh, stimulation, there's decrease in the anterior cingulate, orbital frontal cortex, and uh, dorsal lateral frontal cortex, and the insula. So, predicting treatment response in OCDs. Alan Sarek looked at 16 patients with OCD pre and post treatment using SPECT. OCD patients with baseline had increased blood flow in, okay, again, the anterior cingulate, prefrontal cortex, and cardiac. Responders showed decreased perfusion in all of these areas. Saxena looked at OCD patients and she compared them to 40 patients. And she had 12 patients who reported and 33 patients with OCD who did report. OCD patients showed increased metabolism and activation. In bilateral cardiac balance to anterior singular. The forwarding patients had lower activation in the dorsal anterior singular, and the severity of the forwarding symptoms corresponded to the decrease in the activity of the dorsal anterior singular. The worse the forwarding, the lower the activation of the dorsal anterior singular, and the poorer their response to medication. And here's just one image from Saxena for uh, This is the yellow is uh, areas of decreased activation of dorsal anterior cingulate in a, uh, uh, where you would expect to see this. These are uh, hoarding patients and uh, uh, compared to non-hoarding OCD patients. 
Heather looked at 26 OCD patients, compared their, their spec and breast, and to a patient with a provocation. If you were a germaphobe, you know, hung a garbage can in front of you, or you know, some filthy piece of garbage in front of you to provoke a reaction and did spec on them. And what he saw was OCD showed elevation, the anterior cingulate, dorsal lateral frontal cortex, and bilateral caudate. Are you seeing the pattern? Now, Simon did the same study using fMRI. Okay, expect his words less, fMRI's words have less look at fMRI. Did the same study. OCD showed increased uh, perfusion. fMRI showed perfusion in the anterior cingulate, dorsal lateral frontal cortex, bilateral caudate, and bilateral phalanx. Rausch did a study before Singulata using PET, same result. Saxena did this study uh, that I mentioned before where the findings on baseline predicted the response to process. And last, let's just show you this case. This is a patient who had a pain per scan diagnosed with ADHD, treated with stimulants, was not getting better. Scan the patient, here's his baseline scan, here's his concentration scan. I use the Stroop colored word test uh, it has my concentration scan. I don't know if you've ever actually done one. They're really pretty challenging. Okay, so you get into the third part of the stroop colored word test. Your frontal lobe is working hard, and your frontal lobe has to in inhibit the response. So it's a nice test. And as Dr. Amon has already pointed out, in 85% of kids with ADHD, they will drop their frontal cortex act activity when they concentrate. I see no evidence of that between here's my oral frontal cortex between baseline and concentration. What I do see is a very active anterior cingulate, which gets more active when he concentrates. We see a cottage, which arguably gets more or less depending on which side you look at when he concentrates, and a thalamus, which gets more active when he concentrates. If we compare that statistically to an Asian match normal database, his frontal cortex is lit up. If I showed the anterior cingulate, it would be lit up. This is a patient with OCD who was diagnosed based on clinical symptoms with ADHD. Now, you've got a good chance of being right, and you know, stimulants are benign, and you go out and give them, and they only last a few hours, and if you're wrong, then you know, the patient doesn't respond. Or the patient will respond quite badly, and I think Dr. Raymond has given a couple of examples of that. So this is just one example of where neuroimaging made a dramatic difference for this uh, patient. Now, could a clinical exam have gotten that? Possibly. But the point about uh, spec scans and ADHD is not, is it ADHD? It is, what else is it? Because ADHD is a DSM-4 diagnosis. You're hyperactive, you're impulsive. It's sort of like oppositional defiant disorder. You're oppositional, you're defiant. It has very little neurobiological meaning. Now, ADHD is a little bit better. It's actually one of the strongest ones we have in terms of neurobiology say with 85% uh, certainty that they're going to have decrease in their oral frontal cortex, likely in the temporal uh, lobes, and also in their cerebellum. Uh, and that gets better when you give them a stimulant, and that's been shown, yeah, oh. But toxic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, all the other things that can masquerade it as ADHD, anxiety, OCD, those are the things that we miss if we don't do functional brain injury. And I'm going to stop there. Next year we'll do